Yes, that's it. So uh, my name is Mukom. Uh, I work for Afinic. I'm a teacher and I teach IPv6. And I want to talk to you about the results of a survey that my team and I we did. Um, that was during African Internet Summit. That was uh, May. Of course, you all know what the problem is. Africa's way too, too red here, right? Way too red. And we need to change that. And there's this growing frustration because we do lots of trainings, we do lots of conferences, we do lots of naming and shaming, and we're still lagging behind. So, that's my alter ego, by the way. <laughs> so, we put out a survey, and one of the most important questions in that survey was, can you tell us what is your number one IPv6 deployment challenge? We sent this survey to probably more than 8,000 network engineers all over the continent. I promise you there was no spam involved because, you know, <laughs> one on mailing lists, on social media, but every single person who had come to all of our trainings since 2005, we send them, please tell us, you've gotten training, you've gone to conferences, can you tell us what is your number one IPv6 deployment challenge. Why did we ask this question? That's because Afinic, we are trying to reboot our IPv6 support program. Because we had one three or four years ago and it just went, you know, it just fizzled. And so we thought, let us ask the people who should be doing something but aren't what the exact challenge is. First of all, Asking that question and doing this survey will help us clarify the exact problems in the words of the people that should be deploying but aren't. Secondly, it will help us figure out what should we be measuring in terms of you know, leading measures. If I could just ask, what's the difference between you know, um, a scale for measuring your weight and a smartwatch? There are two devices that might help you accomplish the same thing, right? A measuring scale, you, know, you step on it at the end of the month to check your weight, and then you've got a smartwatch. A measuring scale gives you something we call a lagging indicator. You, don't, you, you won't know until after one week or after one month. That's exactly what the APNIC starts, that red map, that's what it tells you. Useful for making presentations at conferences like this. Totally useless for helping people push them into action. So we need different sorts of measures. And that's why I brought the analogy of a smartwatch. How many people have ever gone to the mall and parked a bit further just so that they could walk? Why did they do that? Because they had something on their, on their wrist that says, you know, you have what, 2,000 more steps to go today. That's an example of a leading indicator. So the hope was that when we do this survey, we'll get some ideas about what good leading indicators to start tracking an Afrinic. Then, of course, there is what are we going to do as Afrinic to support its deployment? And all that thing you see there, that's what we call scientific guesswork. Anything we do, we'll only keep doing it for so long as it actually drives some kind of indicator. If it's not driving, one or two quarters down the road, we've got to drop it. So that's why we're doing the survey. So the two parts of the survey, so, survey there is, of course, we ask the normal questions to get to some context. Uh, what's your role, network engineer, manager, uh, project manager, consultant, other? Uh, what kind of network do you work at? Service provider, data center, uh, campus, large and small. Um, so, we, so that's quantitatively. And then we ask, can you give us a status of IPv6 deployment at different parts of your network, at the edge, at the core, on the access network, or on the content side? So you know, it's done in progress and testing, not started. So it's just quantitative. But again, those were just to provide context. But the most important question was that open-ended question. What is your most significant deployment challenge? So, you got 690 responses. Well, that pretty much covered almost all of Africa. 
And yes, we did get some responses from the US and from Eastern Europe. For one percent of them were French, and 59 percent were English speaking. So the top 50 respondents came from the following countries, Nigeria, South Africa, Cameroon, Kenya, Togo, Mali, Benin, Cote d'Ivoire, Tanzania, and then Zimbabwe. So, which means the, the, the answers that you're going to see are pretty much representative of these countries. Now, let's see what is the status, the deployment status by different types of network as reported in the survey. Data center, mm, everyone who self-reported the work at the data center, the key thing is to look done in progress testing. If you see lots of tall bars here, that's bad news. So, data center, not much happening. Large campuses, campus networks, eh, those would be the large universities, etc., which is pretty much representative of, you know, what my team and I will see as we move around different countries doing training. Small to medium campuses, just nothing happens, which also makes sense. It's consistent with, you know, what we've observed as we go around different countries. Enterprises, now that is just ridiculously, nothing is like radio silence. <laughs> nothing is happening in any kind of enterprise network. And to make it worse, they don't even have plans. No one has plans in enterprise networks. And this is consistent because whenever we sp we've spoken to Managers of service provider networks, the number one complaint was enterprise customers just don't care about IPv6. So this is consistent with that. Yeah, that's where it begins to get a bit better. ISPs, large and small, they're the ones doing the most to do with IPv6, you know, deploying it, you know, they've got it, it's in progress or it's, it's done, it's in progress or they're testing it, and also they're planning to. So ISPs, large and small, those that's where the action is taking place. Then there's other categories which we just ignore for now. So by way of comparison, you could see that service providers definitely, based upon the reports of this survey, are leading the charge to deploy IPv6. Sensibly in the sense that if the service providers are not ready, you know, the enterprises, the campuses that depend on them, aren't going to do any, get anything, any IPv6 done. Of course, we are I'm not considering things like tunnels, et cetera, et cetera. So that was a quantitative part of the deal where we just, you know, we get counts, we do analysis, we create beautiful charts. But that's typically very unreliable data. The most important question we asked in this survey was, what is your most important challenge? Right. Which means it's open-ended. And in order to analyze this, what we did was, we sorted all the answers based upon the length of that answer. The reason behind this being, you know, if you ask me, Taman, how are you? It's fine. But, oh, I'm amazing, you know. Yesterday we went to, to a nightclub, I got drunk, I got kicked up to the beach and all of that. The longer the response, the more passion, the more there is at stake, skin in the game. So that's how we sorted it. But we only asked, what is your number one deployment challenge? What you would find out is that in those stories, there were lots of different challenges. So we had to code them. You know, it's a manager, it's an ISP, and then that's how we were able to atomize all the responses and get counts. So for people who identified themselves as engineers, network engineers, security engineers, systems engineers, these were their top challenges. Number one, management. 14% of them said the number one problem is that management is unsupportive. Then you've got knowledge and skill that they don't have the knowledge and skill to do it. 13% uh, said the service provider is unwilling or not ready to provide IPv6. Actually, across, I think two companies across this continent stood out, Telcom and Ethiopia Telecom. You know, Telcom South Africa and Ethiopia Telecom, that, you know, they were mentioned specifically as a problem why they couldn't do IPv6. 12% said they just don't have the confidence. They might have attended the training, but the confidence to actually start doing it in a real-life network. They just don't have it. 
Um, 11% said IPv6 is not a priority. Then 8% cited some specific issues. And the, the nuance is that, you know, you could read the kind of specific issue and you know someone did try something. For example, someone says, um, we've got this active directory schema that starts in country A and I'm in country C. I can't do anything until that part starts. Or you've got, you know, another vendor that was mentioned quite often is Microtik. In the smaller type networks in Africa, Microtik runs a lot, and particularly in the educational sector. And if you're running a hotspot, I've gotten lots of complaints that, you know, there's two things, BGP across all the cores of your router, but also accounting, because you just, you just don't want to leave it free. free. So accounting on Microtik just doesn't work about IPv6. So there's very specific, you know, responses that. Now, funny enough, a lot of people say they don't know how to create an IPv6 addressing plan. So one of the, one of the analyses I'm going to do, because there's a question we asked, when was the last time, have you attended a training in the last three years? So we'll try to find what is the correlation between whether they've attended the training and the ability to say they were able to create an addressing plan. Um, some of then others say, no, there's no customer demand or they don't know how to do a deployment plan, which is you know, the step, the project, how to projectize an IPv6 deployment project. So, there's some problems that we have to, you know, tear our head, our hair out to try and solve. Some problems are solution known problems. So, everyone, I mean, there are a couple of people who said they don't have an IPv6 address block. Hmm? So, for those people, you're just going to create a long queue and your registration services. Go get your IP address space. You don't have an excuse for that. What about managers? This is what managers see with their biggest problems. These are people who self-identified as managers, technical managers, project managers, executives. 23% there's a knowledge gap. Some of the responses indicated the knowledge gap on the, they, would, they did not trust that their teams had the required knowledge to proceed with the deployment. Some of them actually said, no, I don't know what it takes to help my team do this project. 20% said we need a lot more guidance for ourselves and for our teams because they just don't want to, as they're trying to deploy IPv6, they break IPv4. 13% said it was a provider. 12% um, cited some very specific issues. 10% cited, you know, these legacy infrastructure problems. And curiously, managers said 6%. <laughs> the problem is that managers. <laughs> so which managers are we talking about? <laughs> the guy's up, right? <laughs> and of course, 5% said, said customer demand. But this particular, this particular data point, it was insightful because for, for almost four years, Afrinic, we've had an IPv6 program for managers, but it's just never taken off because somehow we've not been able to find the right audience. And that's something we want to reboot next year. But really, we would like someone that sits at that table when budgets are being made for the next year. That's who a manager is. Because if you're not sitting at that table where you can make those decisions, then you cannot secure the resources and do the politics to enable your IT team to do, deploy IPv6. So, there were some commonalities. <coughs> Both managers and engineers, they were pretty much in agreement about the fact that, you know, a lot more skill and knowledge is required. And then, of course, that we've got the problem with, with operators. Now, what is management support? From lots and lots of the responses, management support means making sure that there is a line in the budget to support the IPC deployment project. I mean, if you work for a, an organization that has something called a strategic plan, you do annual planning, if there's nothing in the budget, it just is not going to happen. Not training, not upgrading equipment, not buying a new IPAM, which you might need for IPv6. Most cases, it's not just going to happen. But also, the man hours. Because in most organizations, if you're an engineer, you don't control your time. Your manager does. So if they say you can't do X, you're just not going to work on it. But also, you need champions, you know, because I've spoke, there's, there's lots of responses which said like, um, the other teams, 
that do not support IPv6. They don't support this project. And I've been to trainings where one guy, after attending our training, came up to me and said, look, after attending your training, I am going to be the number one opposer of IPv6 in my company because it's simply going to be more work for me and no additional benefit. That story has repeated itself over and over. So that's what management support looks like according to the, the responses of the survey. So we'll have a Q and A at the end. You tell me what you think you should, we should do about that. Yeah, there were some interesting challenges. Really, those are word verbatim. Why have you, what's your biggest challenge? I have not been asked to. <laughs> what's your biggest challenge? There's no government regulation. What's your biggest challenge? There's lack of public awareness. What's your, public cha what's your challenge? All websites do not support IPv6. Are those challenges? Come on, tell me. Are those challenges? <coughs> no. <laughs> They're excuses. <laughs> Well-crafted lies, you know. Shove it to someone else. Oh, no. And you, know, you could, because, because we looked at the data, we, we had IP address information for where the re survey responses came from. So we could actually dig deeper. So when someone said, um, I have this problem, even it's, it looks like a reasonable problem. Like, take the example of, uh, say, um, hotspot. So when I looked up one of those, uh, several of those addresses, they came from a university network. I used to work on a university network. Hotspots are run on a, only a section of the network. So if I go, I should expect that if you're really serious, at least the administrative buildings where we don't, we don't, use, the, we don't use the hotspot or the captive portals, that should enable V6. That wasn't happening. So it seems again, you know, some kind of excuse. So one of the things about when we do surveys is we always have to understand there are no facts in surveys. There's just information and people lie. How do I know this? Because sometimes you test. Because someone says, here's my number one problem. And which is why almost everything that we are going to do as part of this Afrinic program 2.0 is to test these assumptions. Give you an example. One manager sent me, uh, Tamon, here's my problem. I'm a manager. I don't necessarily have the skill to outline an IPv6 deployment plan for my engineers. So can you help me? I said, yes, I would. Can we do a conference call next week and Let's talk about how might such a plan look like. What is the strategic planning process in your company like? Let's just talk about it. Two, three times in a row, it didn't show up. Am I supposed to trust that? I'm not, am I supposed to trust that reason for not deploying? No, because it's just failed the test. Now, just to buttress the point that you know, this, the, the survey has given us some data, but sometimes what solutions we proceed to create based on that data, we have to be very careful about. And I'll give you, tell you a story. I'll illustrate that with a story about how the data isn't always saying what you think it is saying. So during World War II, the US Army they had a problem. You know, most of the, 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 the planes, the war planes that went over Germany, they just got shot down. And so the problem, obviously was to just do armoring. But you know, this is physics. If you armor the entire plane, you reduce the range and you increase fuel consumption. Therefore, you had to you know, put armoring where it mattered most. And so the US Army was, you know, they, was into, they were into lots of research. So what they started doing was, every plane that made it back from the war front, they would map out where the holes, the bullet holes were that was supposed to inform you know, data-driven decision-making. Where should we armor? And so, for example, that's an example of such a plane. So looking at this, where do you think, which parts of the plane need armoring? There's some parts where there are no bullet holes, and there's some parts with lots of bullet holes. Which part of the plane needs armoring? So all the generals, <laughs> so all the generals, really looked at all of this data and said, oh my God, we need to armor all of these parts. It was a mathematician whose name was Abraham Walk. I come and say, no, that's not it. Because the data you need to make that decision isn't here. 
because all, all planes, wherever you don't see bullet holes, all planes that were shot there did not make it from Germany for you to measure. So, <laughs> yeah. All the, yeah. So this, this is actually, where, where there is no bullet hole, that is where the plane is much more, which is most vulnerable, right? This, because the planes make it here despite all of these bullet holes. You don't need to worry about this part. And that is our biggest fear when we do surveys and you, we get all of this. What exactly should we do with that data? And I'm going to be soliciting for you know, questions and you know, suggestions for what we Afini could do to help that. Meanwhile, um, just to finish this, so, but because of this, whatever suggestions we get, whatever ideas we come up with, they will be rigorous testing. We will only continue doing it if we can prove that that initiative, that project, is driving some deployment metric. Otherwise, we'll drop it. And for my last thing, and so one of the things we will be thinking about doing next year is to some kind of award. What do you think about this idea for, you know, for the teams, for the individuals that are doing the most to drive IPv6 deployment? No, it's not going to be money. It's going to be objectively measured. So if you think that this might be something you might want to support, just come talk to me. So questions? Hi, Andrew here from Liquid. Why am I always first in the queue? Um, <laughs> I, I, I just have a, a comment rather than a question for all the people who responded that budget line items were necessary for management support and you needed budget line items. Quite frankly, those people need to get over themselves. There is no budget line item needed to do this. It's an excuse. The the fact is that the hardware, anything modern, supports the V6 today. It's about doing the work. You don't need large amounts of budget. Believe me, if I went internally and asked for budget to do my V6 even inside a company the size of mine, it wouldn't happen. We did it. So really, um, I know that engineers want money for fancy toys, but don't use it as an excuse to stop progress. Thank you. So, this isn't a defense at all. Um, it's no excuse not to deploy V6 in your network. Mm -hmm. It's, as Andrew said, resource and all those kind of things are just an excuse. Um, one thing in your website that's always concerned me is that, for example, I can't afford the V6 space I have. The V6 space on the website for anything greater than slash 32 is 20,000 US dollars. Now, I know it's always been said IPv4 V6 is free mm -hmm. as long as you have a V4 address space. When V4 runs out, things are going to change. Things have to change. And what's the, what's the cost going to be then? And I think that could be a, I think maybe that's where um, money comes in. That's where the fact is, when, that, when it gets charged, what are we going to be charged? I know if, if I'm going to charge $20,000 for my V6 space, I'm handing it back because <laughs> well, well I, I, can't, I can't run a business out V6, I also can't run a business for not making money. I totally understand that and here's the, here's the ways that um, lack of clarity around that pricing thing has you know, influenced some of the things we do in trading. So for example, Jan Zos presented this uh, uh, big copy about about you know, recommended prefix sizes. While it's okay for us to teach, it's okay, do a slash for every customer. I've got lots of people saying, come on, who's going to pay for this when we actually have to pay for it? Unfortunately, the guy who can give you the answer is standing right there, Alan Barrett, the CEO of Afrinic. <laughs> yep. Um, hi. I, according to Afrinic's current fee structure, um, if you have V6 only and if it's more than a slash 32, then yes, there's some enormous charge, um, which really doesn't make sense. Um, the board has started a process of revising the fees and I can't tell you what the exact results are going to be but I can tell you that um, it will not be $20,000 for a slash 31. Um, it'll be reasonable. Um, it'll be more or less the same as you would expect to, to pay for um, that order of magnitude. It's hard to explain. Um, the 
board will want advice from me, I guess, about what the fees should be. And I can't tell you what the board will do, but I can tell you what advice I will give. And that advice will be that a, a small-sized V6-only ISP should pay roughly the same as a small-sized V4-only ISP. Um, and so that will not be $20,000. Thank you, Alan. So hopefully that clears it up. Mark Alkins. Uh, Mark Alkins, more of a comment. I got my V6 almost 11 years ago. So for the last 10 years, I've been dual stacked. All my customers are dual stacked. I, I'm just wondering what all the fuss is about. Well, the <laughs> maybe I can answer that question because I'm okay. just a bit scared that we are preaching to the converted here. Mm -hmm. um, I had a slide up earlier on and uh, there were the, the top three or top four basically account for 40% of our country or something like that. And I was wondering if anybody in the audience is from any of those top three. Do we have anyone here from Telcom, MTN, or Vodacom? So we, we, we're exactly not preaching to the, to the choir because you know, the, the deployment dashboards don't show. South Africa and Africa is still largely red. So, and which, which is why I say, when you measure at that level, we want to see the traffic, the V6 traffic actually passing. Because simply announcing, you know, I mean, in the early days, five years ago, you know, progress was, I've got a blog of, from Afrinic. Yay. But that really doesn't count. The next step which we not need to count is, you know, are you advertising it? Your website, is it ready? You know, are you passing something? Until you get to that point, we aren't there yet. Not even close. So. Another big challenge is customers. How do you get them, especially in the enterprise or industry, in, in the enterprise world? Mm -hmm. we, we're training our engineers to be V6 enabled. We, we, you've done all the training that you guys have done. Mm -hmm. We give it, give our staff time to play, and we, people, everyone's dual stacked mm -hmm. and all those fantastic things. But the guys in the enterprise, they've got so many different BUs, business units, and the security business unit mm -hmm. won't touch anything because then the firewall unit has to do everything, and then the networking unit guys, they're so constrained from what they know and what they we need to do, they're not interested in it. I went on a little exercise a few months ago to try and give our customers V6. The update, I think we, on the 10 customers I spoke to, one was interested, and unfortunately it's gone nowhere. They, they're all interested. A lot of them just say, oh no, we, we don't have the time, management, and I think maybe that's what we need to focus on, is not the ISPs, but actually the, the corporates and the businesses. So I, I get your argument uh, at all, but here's the thing. For, I would, I would take that as an argument if you, you say on, on your website, anyone who wants IPv6 can get it, right? Because if you haven't, because there are lots of you know, ISPs that are not offering IPv6, so the customers, even those who care, because there's lots of university admins who want to deploy IPv6, and they don't have the burden of, uh, you know, um, the burden of you know, managers and all of that, but guess what? The ISP just won't. And sometimes the simple things like, I know one of the largest operators on this continent. I know people who are unable to turn up a BGP peering session with Nova V6 for six months. That's reality. So that argument holds so because one, you already you have you have the ability to provide provide IPv6 to them. But some haven't done that. So we can't push it. So how about we do the things that are within our, you know, within our circle of control? Make sure we can provide transit our websites where possible. And then also put it on our website, because if I go to your website, if I come to, uh, to, to the eNetworks website, will I see something that says, if you are an enterprise customer on one IPv6, fill this form and we get to you? I mean, small things like that, I believe that are quite useful. Mitch? So, um, Michuki Mwangi, Internet Society. So there's a, a tool that we've, been, uh, we've developed and helps us get an idea of what's really going on with respect to IPv6, uh, not in terms of um, whether people are actually using it, but it, whether actually the prefixes are showing up um, on BGP. In BGP, yeah. And in particular, at the IXPs. So okay. the measurements that we're doing is uh, mm -hmm. whether the announcements are showing up at the IXPs. So when I look at the tool with respect to South Africa, mm -hmm. And this is again not, uh, we, we are not including NAP Africa in this um, um, 
in these measurements as yet because we are yet to get the tool in place. This is looking at uh, the inkses, uh, so jinx, yeah, dings, jinx, jinx, uh, jinx. So 47% of all IPv6 blocks assigned to South Africa by um, Afrinic actually been seen at the inkses, and 53% are not. Now, if you want to do a comparison, 53% of the IPv4, um, sorry, 66% of the IPv4 uh, prefixes assigned to by Afrinic to South Africa mm -hmm. are seen from the same same type of collectors. Mm -hmm. So it's actually not too bad if you think about it, 66% mm -hmm. V4 um, and 47% mm -hmm. of uh, V6. It means quite a number of them are actually making the announcements on BGP at the local IX, which is really good. The question is, is it going all the way to the last mile or to the customer? And maybe the, the questions that we are sending out to the operators is, what's blocking them pushing it to the customer? Because on the core mm -hmm. and externally facing to the transit points and peering points, that's being done and seems to be a growing trend. But it's towards the end to the customers that seems to be, you know, there's some block or some barriers for them to actually uh, actualize that. And maybe the next service that you do or whatever uh, things, we should try to focus as to why is it that's not being assigned. And I'll give an example. Um, at home in Nairobi, I have um, connected to a, a, a service provider. I had a YMAX connection for the longest period, and it was on V6. I was dual stacked. And then it was an expensive service. Now they have FTTH, which was great. So I was among the first few to move when the service came to my neighborhood. And the moment the box came in, I'm no longer on V6. And when I wrote to them and said, hey, they said, yeah, we are kind of still trying to test that. So there, seem to be a, there seems to be some issues with the deployment towards the customers. And maybe that's where we should try and focus and see how we can help. So uh, thank you very much. For, I, 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 that's why I love the approach of, you know, um, so for example, deployment at an IXP, for example, could be a leading indicator, yeah. right? So if we go to a country where lots of operators don't even have a prefix, then we don't even have, we're not even trying to solve the problem of announcing them. So make sure they get them. So in a country like South Africa, for example, then, our training efforts shouldn't be around get V6 prefixes. Maybe that's not, it should be, you know, how do you push it to, 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 to customers? And I particularly like the fact that, because theoretically you would think the percentage of V6 prefixes that should be announced should be 100%. No, in reality, if it's equal to what is being announced in V4, then you're there. So I like that perspective. But how is that going to influence our strategies in the IPv6 program? As we collect this data on a country by country basis, it might inform what kind of interventions, interventions we do in the country. So some countries, it's going to be basic training, get, get v6. In others, okay, here's how you can announce. And at some point, okay, we have to start pushing, you know, how do you deploy services, email, and all of that stuff. And then, of course, there's still the training for managers. Um, and for the, for the service providers, is it so far-fetched you think it's important to put it on your website? I offer IPv6. If you want it, fill this form and sign up. Is that such a terrible idea for the service providers in the room? Okay, thank you very much. If you've got questions, we can take them on the Afrinic mailing list. Thank you. <laughs>